Hello. So Jeanette, your work with human animal relationships is incredibly relevant to our theme of well-being today. Could you tell us a bit about how that interest came about? Oh, um, so it literally started when I was a baby social worker. In fact, my first student placement, um, I was in the Riverland and there were some young kids ended up locked up. Anyway, long story, but one of the girls in particular had a dog that had had puppies, lots of them, and she was um, most distressed about her dog and the puppies and what would happen. Mm. And so I spent my student placement worrying about her dog and her puppies and we took them, a friend came up and we took them to a rescue place, but she didn't have anything else. They had really stark lives. Um, and yeah, so I think that's there. There you go. It was really, really early. So um, yeah, that's understandable. That and <laughs> as a uh, a very obsessed owner of a cat myself, it is um, good to know that people are looking at this area of well being to you know boost my little obsession. <laughs> Can you tell us <laughs> what's involved in your research? Most much of my applied focus is around older people. Um, that's kind of just happened, um, partly because I had, uh, like I'm comfortable and confident in that space and my networks have been around ageing and aged care. Um, and because of in some ways it's like, you know, you kind of choose an age group. And if you're looking at vulnerable groups, so there's people looking at homelessness and pets and there's a little bit of stuff but not much around children and pets. There's quite a bit of stuff around um like structured kind of relationships with animals, so the assistance animals, therapy, that kind of thing. I'm really, so I was really interested in the pet stuff and in some ways it's just kind of happened. I've made some of it happen, but it's that thing about where you find places that people are interested and you start talking with people who are also interested in the topic and um, it's kind of evolved that way. Yeah. yeah. Well, it sounds like it's um, been a instead of starting with a specific thing, that evolution has uh, really influenced your research. So what kind of findings have you found along the way that has led you, that has directed your research? Some of the, so I think working back from the most recent stuff that we've just published is the stuff of people actually talking about not taking their own life because of a pet which um, is pretty stark and in your face. And, and when you stop and think about it, it's also like a no-brainer as well. Um, I think that the power of the relationships, so, you know, it's, it's hard to, to help people to find meaningfulness in life and to make those choices about not taking their life. And so to, to have people literally telling you about how a particular dog or, you know, the birds that they look after or the, the other kinds of species they look after had actually prevented them from taking their own life was, was has been really, really powerful. And I think that just accentuates how for some people, so not for everyone, but for some people, these relationships are just, um, just quite amazing. I mean, relationships, we're, we're human beings, you know, we relate to each other as, as humans, but Pets are these um, gentler, softer, um, more forgiving relationships than we we have. Then, like human relationships are really complex. So the simplicity of relationships with pets is, um, I guess, for most, or certainly for me, you know, much more soothing. The dogs don't see that I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> you know, so that's sort of the gentleness of that relationship. And then when once you're alerted to it, you start to see it all over the place. So. Once you start to look at other literature and other research that isn't looking specifically at pets, say, so there's some stuff around children and cancer and cancer treatments and little bits in there like, oh, you know, the dog keeps me company during the day because they can't go to school anymore. So, like, we can relate to that now in our recent time. So, so what I'm now really interested in, and it comes from my background of social work particularly, is like, so what do we do with this knowledge? So doing some kind of primary research stuff, which is about just collecting knowledge. But I'm really interested in, in what do we do? So just today I was doing um, a focus group with some people aged over 60 and we were talking about what might sit in between pets and no pets. So if you would really like to have some pet 
contact, but you're going, I can't afford it. I like going away. I'm just worried about the pet's well-being because my health isn't so good. How can people actually get that kind of connection? Um, what are the ideas? What are the pros? What are the cons? So really quite a lot of action type research and very much participatory engaging with people who would be end users, who are having the experience to actually go, okay, well, what will work for you? Very applied sort of research. Hmm. Those are such good questions to be asking. I, I, I often think about pets in terms of well-being because I know for me personally, there was a period I was going through that was quite tough and my sister used to bring her dog over and let me look after the dog. And it made such a difference because then I would definitely go for a walk every day because you can't mm. say no to an adorable dog. <laughs> and also the dog's always so happy to see you. So you feel like a good person all the time, even if you're having trouble convincing yourself of that. Mm -hmm. I found it really um, heartbreaking when I was reading um, a couple of articles that you gave to us, and I think we'll link to them in the chat today. I had no idea that in a lot of aged care homes, people aren't allowed to take their pets with them. Mm -hmm. By and large, people can't take their pets. So, um, yeah, it's quite sad. And I guess like at this point when aged care facilities have been in lockdown, you know, it would have been really nice, wouldn't it, um, if they could have had some animals there, you know, their pet with them. Every now and then... Um, facilities manage to incorporate people having their pet with them which is lovely um, what I'd like to see and the projects one of the projects we're working on is particularly about like how do you actually enable that so that it doesn't become just the odd now and then but it's actually something that um, the aged care system can actually pick up and run with it's not gonna be it's not gonna work for everyone and every time um, but how do we actually make it to work as much as possible when people would really like that? And I think one of the things in this field is that at one level it's really um, sweet and frivolous and it seems so simple, but it actually is really complex. Like I, I don't think I ever talked to an aged care provider who um, doesn't think it's a great idea mm. for people to be able to bring their pets with them or for there to be human-animal contact in aged care. But the doing it. It's just, it's just harder. It's just hard because, because of a whole range of factors. Risk is probably one of the key things. Um, the fact that they're funded to look after people, not to look after animals. We don't have an intersection of human and animal care um, in our systems yet. We don't have people that are trained in both, for example. So in aged care, the workers are trained to look after human beings, not to look after pets. Um, which is quite reasonable. And if you've got someone who's needing um, care and support themselves and their ability to care for an animal is probably going to be a little bit impeded as well. So somehow it's finding the pathways forward. I mean, my, I don't know, quote me in 10 years maybe, my sort of hunch is that I think that this space is going to grow. What I find is that millennials really understand this. Um, and really take it seriously in a way that, to be quite honest, my generation and older, um, we perhaps don't take it as seriously, like kind of as a cohort. So I reckon, yeah, I reckon that into the future, we're going to see maybe even like training where people are trained in aged care of the person, but they're all also perhaps trained in the animal care, animal services. I'm not sure, but I, I do think the field's really expanding and the ideas are percolating. So I, I think I'm really, really lucky. Yeah. Um, I'm there at this point when it's changing and it's moving. It's, it's lovely. It's really nice. I can just imagine, like, my mum has a pet bearded dragon and I can just imagine her and like 90 years old with this bearded yeah, dragon on shoulder. Yeah, on her shoulder and the nurses being like, look, I've only been trained in cats and dogs. <laughs> do what do I do with this? <laughs> yes. um, That's so yeah. interesting did... thinking about generational shifts yeah. as well. I never thought of it in that way. Mm. But of course, my sister was studying in Canada for a while and around exam time they were all um given a chance to go and hang out at a yeah. puppy shelter mm. yeah. so that they could de-stress before exams yeah. yeah yeah that actually reminds me when I was younger I used to work in a nursing home over the summer and I'd bring in the therapy llamas 
Um, oh, yeah. Have you noticed any differences between whether it's your personal pet or mm. your somebody else's pet? Oh, definitely. And I think that there's kind of like a fudging of the of the language. Um, so the the most recent publication in this space, which um, was looking at pets in aged care, used the term personal pets. So those are the animals that are personally known to us, that we have a relationship with. And that's the stuff that, you know, that's the kind of relationship that stops someone from taking their own life. It's not just about having a dog, any dog. It's that personal interrelationship. So I remember one, one lady in particular was able to identify which of her three dogs was protective. And that's because she knows each of them individually. She knows their characteristics. She understood which one would miss her and be, be devastated by her loss. Um, yeah, it's very, it's, it's very different than the general, oh, we have, we have pets at the nursing home. I'm sure that people can develop close relationships with those animals as well, but there is a difference between, um, there, is, there is something about that sense of a unique relationship. The people that were being interviewed about their personal pets talked about how other, you kind of have to share them in the nursing home. <laughs> Um, but there's, there still seems to be that sense of like this is a personal relationship. So yeah. um, yeah. my pet, as a, as opposed to the pet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and I use the kind of example of like you know, um, if I saw a dog in the middle of the traffic, I probably would try to rescue it. But there's a couple of dogs that I would run into the traffic to rescue because <laughs> they're my puppies. They're the the animals that love me and I love them. Mm -hmm. um, it's highly personal and that's that's how it works. And that's what makes some of the, um, I think we're realising more in this research space that it is subjective and that that's just, that's that's actually what makes it work. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, because you can't do randomised control studies around this stuff. Um, you can't just go, okay, we've got 10 people, we give five a pet and five not a pet and see what happens. Because of its individual, you know, I, I use the example, you know, that line like, can you prove that pets work for people? It's like, well, can you prove that kids work for people? Because like, like I read real life crimes, some people's kids kill them. Like, I don't think that's a good indicator that my dog's not going to do that. Do you see what I mean? Like, it's, like, it's yeah. the wrong question. I think what we need to be doing is identifying for who animals for who and when these human animal relationships are really powerful and then how do we um to some extent how do we hook into that so how do we keep people safe um by knowing that um, a pet can be protective against suicide um how do we keep people exercising and walking and moving by the fact that you know, they engage with a dog that's that's whining at the door or they, you know, they feel like they have to care for this animal so they just get themselves moving around, the incidental exercise stuff. So I think we're moving into that space where it's a bit more sophisticated than just, you know, let's just give people a dog and check that they're okay. Yeah. So I've seen a little bit of an internet trend going around of um, like meme threads of people whose dad said they didn't want a cat and then <laughs> six months later, all they care about is the cat. So mm -hmm. what, what can you comment about when people are presented with a pet that they didn't think they wanted but do fall in love with? I think, I think that's really nice. Um, I don't have particular... Uh, what do I think? I've seen it with my own friends. There's a, a friend of mine, Eduardo, keeps posting on Facebook now. He didn't used to have pets. We used to talk about my research um, and he was going, oh, I don't really get it kind of thing. There's this cat that's taken over. So there's, you know, there's these photos of him and the cat <laughs> all the time. And it's that kind of sense of like, and that's that relationship stuff. Like people fall in love with an animal, like with an individual. Um it's, it's lovely. It's, you know, that people write books about all this stuff, you know, about the re actual real relationship stuff. I think the, the caution is probably a step back, which is so someone asked me the other day, like, okay, should we, you know, mum's getting older, she's living on her own, should we just get her a dog? And my, call, and my response is maybe, like, chat to mum, talk with mum about what she's interested in, think through the logistics. Has she had pets before? Most of the people that I'm talking to ha um, have a history of pet ownership. So if it's not been part of someone's life, then it's probably not a great indicator that this is going to work for them because nobody nobody makes you have pets. People say they're teenagers do, but even that I go, oh, yeah. Um, 
nobody makes you have pets. So there's this real choice stuff about it. Um, and that's important because that says it's a resource we can harness. You don't have to make people have pets, but you can get them engaging and doing health stuff. Um, but it's going, okay, so, you know, so mum, would you be interested in a pet? Have you had pets before? What about if something happens to mum? Where's the pet going to go? Even if it's like she has a fall one evening, one night, gets picked up by the ambulance, who's going to pick up the dog, the cat, what have you? So I think thinking through the logistics, it could work really, really well. But there's, the, the risk to the animal is part of this as well. Like it's, um, we can't just think about how like these are tools for humans. They're individual beings, you know, that they have their own needs and rights. Increasingly the, the sort of literature around the politics of this stuff. So there's actually writing around the notion of animals having a form of citizenship particularly the domestic animals that we live with, because we bring them into our spaces. Um, therefore, we've taken away their right to have independence, that, that we owe them something. In the same way as we owe people who can't somehow can't speak for themselves, um, they have rights to have their needs and their interests explored and looked after and responded to. Mm. So, yeah, so I think I think it's a really interesting sort of like combo of like this sort of big political picture hits the everyday worlds that we all, that most of us know, you know. Yeah. And Honestly, and it husband. sounds like um, between the logistical things of making sure that the pet is also being looked after as well as the parent, um, mm. but also that we owe them something because they can't speak for themselves. It really sounds like we're including pets as part of our own community. Mm, and you've yeah. talked a little bit about the logistics of um, if someone else needs a pet for their own well-being, but what can you tell us about what people should be um, taking away from your work? I think the key thing I would like to, people to take away is that understanding of pets as being other sentient beings, other living beings with rights and personalities and characters. Um, and... But also I think like a sense of joy around, I'm really glad that we're in a world that has other beings in it. Um, I think we're incredibly blessed and privileged to, to have these other beings um, around us. And so I think, yeah, I think like a sense of joy and privilege and how that should, you know, I, this is all very philosophical sounding, isn't it? But, you know, like how, like how can that shape our thinking differently about the world? You know, I'm more likely to be thinking about you know vegan food nowadays the more I work in this space um why wouldn't you kind of think if, if you know like I'm privileged to live with other creatures um and I need to give that back to them and think of them think of them with respect and generosity mm. absolutely and you're so right talking about seeing the differences in personalities too like I know when I've been lucky enough to live with um, pets it's such a pleasure to see how they're engaging with the world we mm -hmm. once found behind our dog's bed a little collection of leaves that she'd been <laughs> finding very specific leaves that she decided was special enough to have as a little collection and that stuff I found so fascinating mm -hmm. it was a real privilege to get to watch her growing and mm -hmm. engaging with the world mm -hmm. so you've talked about your work uh, looking at the elderly population and their relationships with animals is there anything else you're working on in this space or a different project that's coming up for you um trying to think yeah look we the, the kind of aged care space is kind of mushrooming mm -hmm. um we're looking, so we started, we've got this, this trial project we're starting to get, it got put on hold for coronavirus, bless it, um, which was about getting foster cats into an aged care service. And that had two aims. One was, the core thing was, how would you be able to have these animals um, looked after in an aged care setting? So that stuff about who, who looks after them, who feeds them, whose responsibility, who cleans the litter tray, that sort of mm. stuff, and how it impacts for people. And, you know, what about the people in, in the facility that don't like cats? People get passionate about cats both ways. <laughs> um, so kind of the idea is to develop a model from that of, like, how you can actually look after animals within aged care. So what are the policies, procedures, etc. 
Um, and then with, with that, it has two kind of aims in mind. One was so that business about people can bring their own pets into care more readily. Um, so having that possible. And the other is actually, and this started out with work, um, talking to uh, Richard Muscle, who was head of AWL here. Um, dogs, are, dogs are getting rehoused at, you know, quite good rates. But cats are the, the species that it's much harder to sort of find homes for. They're sort of, they're still free roaming, you know, the sort of kitten rushes that you get. And so it was about, but foster care has managed to bring down the euthanasia rate of cats that are, you know, end up in, in, in animal welfare type facilities. And so if you could extend foster caring into aged care, so you've got 100 facilities of these, um, you know, older people living residential 24-7, you know, all the possibilities, like you could set up emergency foster care maybe. So when Mrs Jones falls over at home at midnight, the Ambos come and, and she's distressed about what will happen to Tiddles. It's like, okay, it's all right, there's an aged care facility down the road. They've got three three lovely ladies there who are now our registered foster carers. They can look after Tiddles. And so, you know, how could you actually go, A, you're helping Mrs Jones, but also you're giving people meaningful engagement. I mean, when people, as we get older, like they, we're competent, we live these lives. And then, you know, like strokes and other stuff happens and our bodies don't work as well. And people end up in these facilities and the depression rates in aged care can be um, lower than in the community for all sorts of reasons. And the struggle is to give people a sense of meaningfulness in life still. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a possibility for um, helping animals, helping other old people, and also like giving people that are in aged care some meaningful engagement. Like they're, they're, they're helping another older person and they're saving an animal's life. Um, so it's got those kind of two angles we were thinking on, but you need to figure out all the logistics, the policies, the procedures, you know, what, I mean, infection control is a huge barrier, you know, like um, that kind of stuff. How do we work through all those details to actually be able to go, okay, this is how you can do it. And this is a model that whoever wants to be using this model and adapting it to their aged care facility can actually do that. And, they, and who knows where it could spin off. But so that, yeah, that's the stuff that um, we're kind of dreaming about. We've, we've got some connections even internationally, like hope, hoping that maybe we could actually get some trials happening in other countries. It's tricky at this point with COVID. Um, that's all right. We can we can kind of do the planning. So we've got that stuff happening, and then a spin off from that has been um, okay. So we're talking about cats, and we started to talk about risk. That became a major factor, like what happens with the cat poo. Um, but I've talked to older people that have reptiles, like your gran with her lizard sort of thing. Yeah. Um, what are the other animals that people live with? So dogs, cats, birds, fish, reptiles, small mammals. And horses is the other, you know, those big animals. So actually developing a risk management framework around all of those species, not so sure about the horses, but the other ones. So that again, you know, thinking into the future, if um, if your grand, you know, has to go into an aged care facility, but she wants to take her lizard. I've had people giving me the most amazing stories about reptiles and how they engage with them. Um, yeah, you know, like at that time when you're most vulnerable, if she can take her pet lizard with her, that would just be, that would be such a wonderful outcome from this kind of research. But they need specialist care. So there's risk for them. There's risk for older people. You know, we just went through coronavirus. Like, is it, you know, zoonoses? It's come from an animal. It's done the species jump. So you've got to think through all that stuff. So we're, we're working on that, um, doing that with a vet colleague. Um, what else are we doing? And we've also got some stuff. We've got, we got some funding around... Um, Fit barks on cats, don't tell the cats, um, which is about, um, no, there's, there's not, there's, a, there's kind of like this little growth of research around cats. Most of the research around pets is dogs. It's quite specious, you know. Um, even though cats are actually, sometimes in some countries, they're the most popular pet, actually. Wherever people live in small apartments, that sort of thing, cats, you know, a little bit higher rates of ownership. Um, so basically we've got this money with my, my colleague Carmel and it's about fit bucks and it's about basically motion. And so like a cat's, is, do, cat, is cat activity the same when they're living in 
someone's home as they're when they're in the shelter as when they're in foster care that kind of thing so getting some baseline data so so that's kind of just this tangential this tangential it's a it's it's a tangential arm it came from the notion of like if we're going to be putting cats into aged care we need to think about the needs of all of the stakeholders the nurses the people that like cats the people that don't like cats the visitors all the other residents and the cats and you know so it came out of that so it's kind of i'm quite I, my research is i tend to be quite opportunistic like okay let's have a go with this idea but um yeah so we've got some money about it. so it's really again it's it's all that stuff about like um how do we make stuff happen what can we actually have a look at um and see how it works yeah Absolutely. it sounds like it's this huge mushroom as you said mm. of all sorts of different things and I'm, I'm not going to deny that I'm really excited that this research is happening within my <laughs> lifetime so that I can mm. see these benefits in my future. <laughs> with <laughs> me too. With me. <laughs> um, now, at risk of sounding like I'm asking asking for a friend, <laughs> but if people are interested in knowing more, where do you suggest they look? Um, they're really welcome to look at my homepage and to, to touch base with me. Um, the other is that there's this really great association that's just been set up in the last couple of years called Animal Therapies Limited. Um, and so it's really establishing itself as the peak organisation in this general area. So it's particularly interested in the therapy animals, the assistance animals. But, you know, I'm, I'm um, co-chair with Susan Hazel, who's a vet here in South Australia. Um, and so, like, obviously, like, I'm going, oh, what about pets kind of thing? So um, if you're interested in this space, then I think Animal Therapies Limited is a fabulous um, connection. Um, and, and this sector is, it's starting to happen as an actual workspace sector, which I think is really exciting. And I think the other is um, there's an organisation called Australasian Animal Studies Association. If you're interested in that conceptual sort of stuff around uh, politics and animals, for example, they're a really good go-to. Animal therapies is more the applied stuff and I'm kind of in the middle. So I'd love to hear from people, um, especially if you've got ideas on projects that we could do and some places to get money for them. <laughs> Great, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And like Debbie, I'm excited to see where this research goes. And I hope that it ends with me being an old lady in a room full of puppies. <laughs> if you could work that in, that would be great. But thank you so much for joining us today, Jeanette. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Bye.